we get home, and as soon as we walk through the door, they start arguing, they start fighting. My stepdad is threatening my mom. So I ran up to my room and closed the door, and what I would do at that age was I would just turn on music and blast it, because to me, music was a part of how I would get away from the chaos, how I would cope with the things that were going on in my life and in our home. My CD player at the time, it literally stopped working. And so now I'm having to hear the sounds of the arguments. I'm having to hear the sounds of all the turmoil that's happening between them. And so I, I said, Lord, if you care, if you're really the God that I think you are, if you are a good father, if you're a God who can see me, who knows me, I need you to do something to show yourself right now in my room. And the moment I said it, it felt like this blanket fell on my body. I think things started for me probably when I was around eight years old. Uh, so I still have these journals of uh, me writing letters to Jesus at eight years old and these little dialogues between me and the Lord. Uh, but my grandma was a woman of God. And so I remember going over to her house and uh, we'd do sleepovers with her and wake up in the middle of the night to her praying for my my siblings and my cousins and aunts and uncles. And she'd wake up and write down dreams and the Lord would be speaking to her, telling her things in the night. And so I remember really encountering the Lord and learning about who Jesus was uh, at my grandma's house, learning about uh, God and the things of the Lord through my grandma. And so uh, I would say my walk with Jesus started when I was about eight years old, but didn't get serious about the Lord until I was a little older, I would say. Uh, I would say I didn't meet the Holy Spirit. I didn't have like authentic, uh, life-changing, life-altering encounters with God or with the Holy Spirit until I got a little older. My mom, my dad divorced when I was two years old. So my mom got remarried to my stepdad and uh, a few years after that, and. Uh, we quickly learned that my stepdad had a lot going on. He worked in the construction world in Chicago. We were in Missouri. Basically, we, we didn't see him a lot. We only saw him on the weekends because he would fly out and go back to Chicago to do construction. And uh, so we didn't really, or at least I didn't feel like I knew him that well because we only saw him on the weekends. And so uh, I got a little older, probably around the age of seven or eight, we moved to Ohio. And when we moved to Ohio, we were all in the same house every day of the week, nonstop. And I still remember one of my first encounters uh, with really getting to know really who my stepdad was and what he was walking through. Um, we had dinner one night, my dinner table, my mama made chicken or something, and my stepdad didn't like what my mom had made or the way that she had made it. And so I still, I still remember sitting at the table and all of a sudden my stepdad got super mad and he picked up the food, some food from his plate and threw it across the room. I still remember watching the food hit the wall, kind of just fall down the wall. My mom kind of acted like nothing happened. And I remember thinking, I don't think this is normal. And so my mom got up, took her plate and went into the kitchen. My stepdad followed her into the kitchen, and I will never forget to this day, uh, it was the first time I ever saw him put his hands on my mom. And so he grabbed her by the throat, put her in a chokehold on the wall, and I remember trying to decide what to do, I guess kind of one of those fight or flight moments as a little girl. And uh, I ran upstairs to my room, and that was just the beginning of our journey with my stepdad. And so my stepdad was, bipolar, schizophrenic, drug addict, alcoholic. Um, and so walked through a lot of uh, abuse in our home. I wouldn't say I ever experienced any physical abuse by him. I experienced mostly verbal abuse from him or emotional abuse, but my mom experienced some physical abuse. That was the beginning of that journey. Uh, I remember not too long after that, uh, it got to a place where it felt like it was getting pretty bad. And so my mom came to me one day and she was like, you know, your stepdad just left. He went to the grocery store and I need you to go pack up your bags. We're leaving. Hmm. And so we packed up a couple bags, got in the car and started to leave our apartment. And I remember just being so afraid, being overwhelmed, not really knowing what was about to happen. And as we're leaving the apartment, my stepdad is driving towards us in the parking lot of our apartment complex. My mom stopped the car. He got out of the car, came over to her and asked a couple questions, was wondering where we were going. And he looked in our back seat and saw our bags. 
and immediately concluded that we were about to leave him. And so he started freaking out. My mom just started driving. He gets back in the car and he literally starts chasing us down. We're in like this chase down, crazy getaway type of moment. And um, he ends up hitting a car in the parking lot and we keep going. Wow. And so we literally like escaped, got to uh, this other apartment complex, probably about 30 minutes away in a different area of town and then just continued to live life. And I remember thinking, what in the world is this? What are we doing? What's happening? And uh, we moved to another apartment. Super long story short, you know, he eventually found us. And so he started, first he started harassing us via phone. And then he started showing up in our driveway and, you know, he would wait for us to leave in the mornings. And then I remember going to a concert when I was a little girl and getting in late with my cousins and we're trying to walk into our apartment. And my stepdad rushed around the corner and tried to push his way into our apartment with us. And so just a lot of traumatic moments as a little girl regarding my stepdad. Mm. Um, he moved across the street from us so that he could literally look directly into our patio window from his patio window. Felt like we were being stalked. Um, I remember going to school just being afraid that he was going to show up at school. Uh, but just really lived a life of fear all throughout grade school into middle school. And there was this moment where he actually tried to commit suicide. And the idea was that if he didn't succeed, if he didn't actually die in his attempt to commit suicide, that because we were his only family in the area, that we would have to show up and be there for him in that moment. So it was like a massive manipulative move on his end. And um, he didn't die in his suicide attempt. And so my mom showed up to help take care of him in the hospital and kind of be that, that person for him in the hospital. And eventually the doctor said, well, He's ready to go home, but he needs help. He needs care at home. Somebody needs to be there to help make sure, you know, he, he's being taken care of and all the things from the car accident. So my mom agreed uh, for us to take care of him. And so we literally moved across the street from our apartment complex into his apartment complex and literally started this cycle again. Wow. So moved into this apartment. Uh, we helped take care of him for a while. And then um, they got to a place where they were good again and he was being kind of nice because we we were his life was kind of in our hands and so we got to a place where we were doing decently well and then they decided to buy a house in this couple minutes away from the apartment complex we lived in so we bought a house and uh eventually he got connected to uh, some younger guys that were really involved in drugs and gambling that lived one street across from us in the neighborhood we were in. We started hanging out with them. And uh, before we knew it, things started coming up missing in our house. He got involved in some really bad, shady things with these guys and started smoking with them, doing drugs with them. He'd be gone for days at a time. Uh, There's a couple times where we thought he was literally missing. So uh, we would go searching for him and couldn't find him and he would come back and you could see that he had really probably been on a crazy drug binge where he just wasn't well, didn't have it all together. And um, in the midst of all of that, he got diagnosed with um, kidney failure. And that was major. Um, and for those of you who maybe don't know, when you get kidney failure, uh, you have to do something called dialysis. And so that is a couple days a week for several hours at a time where your blood is having to be manually cleaned out and then replaced into your body. And so he was going through that process. Um, so there's tons of things going on. There's abuse in our house. Um, I would say personally, during that season of life in middle school, you know, I'm, I'm working through what you work through as a middle schooler where you're trying to figure out who you are. Uh, I was suicidal. I was depressed. I didn't ever want to go home. I get involved in tons of things in middle school. Everything I could think of to get involved in at school, I got involved with it because I didn't want to go home. Mm. I was afraid to be in my own house. So that's happening. My mom and I's relationship is kind of struggling during this season because I, I was really hurt by some of the decisions that she was making as well. And then obviously I, I wasn't a fan of myself 
stepdad to say it very lightly. I didn't like him. Uh, I think at that age, I probably would have said I hated him. A uh, very strong statement, but I think that was the most authentic thing I would have said during that time. We just didn't have peace in our home. There's this one particular night in the midst of all of this where uh, my mom and I went out to dinner with one of my brothers. And on the way home, my mom, she had turned off her phone, put it on silence or something so we could just focus on being with family. And on the way home, my mom looked at her phone and she had like 20 something missed calls and 10 or 15 voicemails. And uh, I remember being with her and she starts listening to the voicemails and they're all from my stepdad. All the missed calls are from my stepdad. And in one of the voicemails, I remember him saying, if you don't answer the phone, I will kill you when you get home. Hmm. And I remember just being terrified at what was going to happen when we got home. We get home, and as soon as we walk through the door, they start arguing, they start fighting. My stepdad is threatening my mom. So I ran up to my room and closed the door. And what I would do at that age was I would just turn on music and blast it because to me, music was a part of how I would get away from the chaos, how I would cope with the things that were going on in my life and in our home. And so I just blasted music and I was like, maybe I can disappear. Maybe I can just get away from all of this. And my CD player, <laughs> throwback, I don't know if it's stuff sees, but my CD player at the time, it literally stopped working. And so the one thing that I would do to cope, the one thing I would do to try to get away, all of a sudden it's not working nothing's happening. And so now I'm having to hear uh, the sounds of the arguments. I'm having to hear the sounds of all the turmoil that's happening between them uh, in the house. And at some point I hear this really loud bang in my room, in the house from my room. And my first thought was my stepdad just killed my mom. Uh, I heard this loud bang and then I heard nothing after that. And that's what I thought it happened. And so I called 911 on my cell phone and I'm talking to the operator and I'm freaking out. And the operator says, Hey, we're going to stay on the line. We're sending somebody, but I need you to stay on the line and I need you to go into the hallway right now. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, I feel like I was putting my life in danger. And so um, I'm crying, freaking out. I just follow the instructions of this operator. I open the door and when, as soon as I open the door, I see my mom standing on the other side of the hallway and she just looks battered and all disheveled and stuff. And um, my stepdad had, I heard his keys a little bit before that jingle in his pocket down the stairs and I heard him walk out of the door. So I knew he wasn't in the building in, in, in our house anymore, but now I'm looking at my mom and I'm having a just come face to face with, yeah, my mom just got hit. She just got abused by this man again, you know? And so my mom says, I'm going to the car. You can come with me if you want. And I'm like, well, of course I'm coming to the car. And so I jump in the car with my mom and we back our car up into the driveway across the street from our house. And she picks up the phone and calls my grandma. And she starts to tell my grandma, everything that happened and we were, we were sitting there parked there because we're waiting for the police to show up. And so we're talking on the phone to my grandma and my mom's breaking down just minute by minute what had just happened. And basically what happened is when we got in, they argued, they went all the way up into their bedroom and my stepdad was threatening to do things to her. And she picked up the phone real quick and uh, called 911 and then put the phone down. Um, asked for help, put the phone down. And so he saw her do that and basically threatened her that if she does something like that one more time, that he would hit her and do whatever. And so um, he walked away another second later, she picked up the phone again, called my grandma and then put it back down. And when he saw her do that, then he went over and hit her. Um, she fell to the ground and then he left the house. And, um, and so my mom's explaining that to my grandma and I'm listening again, I'm this, this little girl listening to this whole interaction and my heart's just broken. I'm like, why does my mom have to go through this? And why is, why are we in a marriage like this? Like I'm trying to figure out tons of questions about why we're in the scenario that we're in. And again, at this age of my life, 
You know, I had this history with Jesus as an eight-year-old little girl where I journaled to the Lord and I'd write to the Lord. But here I am in my middle school years walking through this and I'm trying to figure out, God, why are you allowing this to happen? If you're real, if you really care about me, if you really care about my mom, if you really care about family, if you really care about f marriage, then why is this the reality that we're living in? Or is it just the truth that you just don't care and you're just this God that's watching and you're aware of all this stuff, but you don't actually care on a heart level about your people. And uh, that was my tension that I was wrestling with during that time about the Lord. And so basically what ends up happening is the police come, they pull up to the house, we walk with them into the house and there's like an empty alcohol bottle and we realize, oh, he was drunk. And so they say, you guys can't stay here tonight. You got to pack your bags. You got to go somewhere else for the night. And so we packed our bags, left our home that night, went and stayed with my grandma. And for several days, we stayed in different places. So we stayed with my grandma. We stayed in this like apartment complex that kind of is set up for short-term rentals for people going through hard situations. And and then I was still going to school. And so I just remember just being like, man, I can't believe this is the life we're living. And then I would go to school and act like nothing was happening. I was, you know, getting good grades, super popular in school. I was an athlete, starting point guard for the basketball team, uh, very charismatic. And, you know, people just liked me, uh, super popular. And I would just put on a smile and no one knew man, we're running for, for our lives, you know, when we're at home and uh, we're living in this crazy abusive situation. I, I even remember writing a, uh, we had like a school project to write a story for English class. And I remember writing my story with different names and hoping that my teacher would discern, would be able to tell that it was my story so mm. somebody could do something to help us. I just remember like trying to figure out any way possible to just get help from somebody if somebody could just see that I was going through a lot in my life and um, felt like nobody caught the cues necessarily. And so we lived in, with my grandma, lived in this other place for a couple of days. And then eventually my mom decided uh, we're going back home. And so she kind of scouted our house out a couple of times to see if he was there. I remember one day she was like, we're moving home, we're going back. So we moved, we went back home, brought our stuff back and she changed the locks and we carried on like nothing happened in our house. And one day my stepdad showed up, knocked on the door with groceries in his hands. And my mom opened the door, he came in, put the groceries up and we carried on like nothing happened. And I remember just being mind blown about this cycle that we were living in. Carried on, as I said before, my stepdad had kidney failure because of the alcohol addiction and different things that he was, just life decisions he was making. He's doing dialysis. Eventually, in the midst of all of it, he starts running away from the dialysis place. And so he would go from dialysis to being put in a nursing home because he wasn't doing dialysis. And then he would threaten to blow up the nursing home and then they put him in a psych ward for a season. And then he'd get back to the nursing home and it was this crazy cycle of all these different places my stepdad's going. And, get, and again, just to drive the point home, I'm still acting like there's nothing happening. Um, one of those days, a similar situation happened where I thought my stepdad had killed my mom. And uh, I'm in my room by myself. And I said, Lord, I know you're real. I grew up in a church where people where eyes, blind eyes opened and uh, deaf ears opened. And I saw people get out of wheelchairs. I, I grew up in the presence of God. I grew up knowing that God was real. But in this season of life, I could not reconcile how this God who was so real could be so not present in my own life and not caring and not attentive to my needs and to my fears and the, the abuse in our home. And so I, I said, Lord, if you care, if you're really the God that I think you are, if you are a good father, if you're a God who can see me, who knows me, um, I need you to do something to show yourself right now in my room. And the moment I said it, it felt like this blanket fell on my body. And it was, uh, the only way I know how to explain it is that it was like this weighted blanket fell on my body. And I wish I could say, I started crying and had this super like heartfelt moment, but the truth is it freaked me out. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, I didn't expect him to show up like that and surely not that quick. 
to my request and he did. He came fast. He responded to me. And so uh, it was this uh, mind blowing moment of like, okay, well, that means you've been listening this whole time. <laughs> that means you've been here. That means you've been a part of all of this. So now the conversation has to change. Mm -hmm. Now the questions have to change. Now I'm wondering what's happening. <laughs> like, what are we doing? What are you doing in me? What are you doing in my family? What is this? What are you up to if all of this is happening, but you've been here the whole time? That was kind of a life or not kind of, that was a life-altering, life-changing moment for me because all I needed to know was that he was there. All I needed to know was that he did know me, is that he did see me, that he was aware of what we were walking through. And so now, now I can lean into you. Now I can talk to you. Now I can ask you questions. And so it just kind of started me on this journey of asking God questions. And I was just like, I want to know you because there's clearly things I don't know about you. If you're in all of this, there's something I don't know. And so it sent me on this pursuit of knowing God. And just in my room, I would just, you know, I would do the thing where you just take your Bible and you just like open it up, put your fingers somewhere. And I would just ask him questions and like, you know, and see what he would say through his word. And he would speak to me. He would show me things in his word. He would tell me that he will never leave me or forsake me. He would he would speak to me through his word. And it was so beautiful, such a tender season with the Lord. And that was amazing. And I wish I could say that the scenario changed, that the circumstance changed, that all of a sudden my stepdad was perfect. My mom was perfect. Everything was great. And we were just some American dream family or something. And that's just not what happened. Um, but what happened was, my relationship with Jesus, my relationship with God, as I began to pursue Him, uh, He changed me. And I became more of a loving person. And He began to convict me about moments where I could do things differently to be there for my mom and to love my mom and to speak life over our family and to pray for our family and to prophesy and to say what God was saying about who He wanted our family to be. And so I began doing those things with Him. And one of those examples of me changing, of him doing something different in me is, you know, I, I mentioned before, I I hated my stepdad. I, that's, that's authentically how I felt about him. To me, he was the reason we were miserable. To me, it was all his fault. That To me, I blamed everything that was happening on him. Um, my mom was singing in the choir. She was at, we were at church every week. She was, a, she was doing her best. She's a strong woman. She raised several kids as a single mom. And so I had so much love and uh, respect from my mom, but I was also struggling with her and just trying to figure out why we were still in the midst of this situation with my stepdad. Uh, but like, to me, it wasn't my mom's fault. To me, it was really my stepdad. Like all of this is can be blamed on this one central character in the story and it's my stepdad. And so there, there's this moment where the doctors told us that my stepdad had 10 days to live. And because of how deeply I hated him, I honestly thought that was sign from the Lord or a gift from God. Uh, I don't believe that today, but in that state of my life, I believed that God did that. I thought God did that to, to rescue us. I went and told my youth pastors at the time and was like, hey, my stepdad was given 10 days to live. It was the only people I knew to like go to and to talk to at that time. And uh, and they played a major role in my relationship and my walk with the Lord. And uh, they were the first people that I ever knew that I, I, I remember I'd be with them and they read my mail. They tell me things that were happening in my life and in my heart that I never told them. So God used them so much in my life during that season. And so when I found out my stepdad was given seven to 10 days to live, they were the first people I went to. And I was like, I don't know what to do, but this is what the doctors just said. And they said, um, the Lord spoke to them and told them, that that night at our youth group, if we prayed for my stepdad and we all praised and just gave God a praise for my stepdad's life, that my stepdad would live longer than 10 days. Hmm. And I remember thinking, no, 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 you, you missed the point. <laughs> like, I don't think, I don't want him to live longer than 10 days, you know? And I was kind of offended that they even said that or that God would say that to them. But, you know, we went to youth group that night and our youth group prayed for my stepdad and they praised God for his life. For the next few days after that, I started having all these encounters with God about forgiveness. I remember seeing billboards and 
commercials on TV and things just coming up about forgiveness everywhere. I watch a TV show and it'd be like about forgiveness or like just weird stuff started happening all over the place where God was trying to speak to me. I fought it at first and then I realized it was the Holy Spirit, that it was the Lord convicting me. Remember how I said that the Holy Spirit, God was changing me. Like that was one of those moments where I realized, oh, he's doing something in me right now uh, that's really deep. And, and so one day, I believe it was about the seventh or eighth day of the ten, of the 10 days that he was given to live. I went into the hospital room, my mom and I believe my aunt were there. And I told them, hey, I need to have a moment with my stepdad. Can you guys just like scoot over to the side, just give me a couple minutes with him. And um, it was a whole moment. They were kind of hesitant. We worked through it. And then I had a moment, I went over with him and something that I had tried to do a few times with him as the Lord was doing things in me before he ended up in the hospital, I would try to read the Bible with him sometimes. So I would tell him, hey, can I read, can we read Psalm 23 together? I would just ask him and see what he would say. And back in those days, he would say no. And so I brought my Bible with me again in this moment in the hospital. And that was the plan was that I was gonna start with just seeing if he'd let me read the Bible with him. And so at this point, he was at a place in his sickness where he couldn't talk anymore. And so he literally couldn't speak out loud anymore. So I went over to him and I just said, hey, can I just read this scripture to you? And he nodded his head and said, yeah, and I was shocked. And so I read a scripture to him and then I just felt this conviction of the Lord that it was that this was the moment to forgive him, to extend forgiveness to him. And so I stood next to him while he was on his deathbed and I forgave him, just told him that I forgave him for everything that he'd ever done to me, everything he'd ever done to my mom, forgave him for not being the father that I always wanted him to be, and just forgave him for anything that I could think of. And then I began to thank him for anything I could think of that he had done. I thanked him for just being in my house when my own dad was not in my house. And just, just thanked him for everything I could think of. And I felt the presence of God in the room. It's like I felt this supernatural peace in the room. The presence of God is like when, when God comes into the room and the atmosphere shifts, it feels like everything's different in the room. That's I felt the Lord come into the room with us. And I knew I was supposed to give him an invitation to know Jesus in the way that I got to know Jesus. And so I said, hey, have you ever accepted Jesus into your heart? And um, he shook his head and said, no. And I said, would you like to receive Jesus into your life, to receive eternal life so that uh, you could be with him forever, no matter what happens on this earth. And uh, one day we can be in heaven together with Jesus, you know, and he nodded his head and said, yes. And so uh, I grew up in a church where they did salvation altar calls all the time, but I had never done a salvation altar call on my own. It was my first time getting to lead somebody to the Lord. It was my stepdad. And so um, I said, okay, this is the only way I know how to do it. So I said, okay, you got to repeat after me to Jesus. And uh, he didn't say anything because he couldn't talk because he was at that point in his sickness where he couldn't talk anymore. And so I said, Jesus, and he didn't say anything. And I said, look, you got to repeat after me. You need to say it, confess it with your mouth, believe it with your heart so that you can be with Jesus. You can receive eternal life. It was a pretty funny moment. I don't know if I would have handled it the same today, but it was amazing. The Lord did a supernatural work. All of a sudden he began to repeat after me. Wow. Uh, and he repeated after me, said the entire prayer. I gave him a hug. It was just a sweet moment in the Lord. And that was it. I walked out of the hospital room and it was like the Lord, <laughs> it was like the Lord in that moment had literally restored our relationship. Years of trauma, years of unforgiveness and bitterness, just like that, the Lord restored our relationship and then restored him to himself. God restored him to himself, Jesus and following Jesus. And um, I tell this specific story because that was a major moment in my walk with Jesus because I, I got to know that God knew me and that he could see me that day in my room. But like, I never knew the love of God like this. The fact that Jesus would receive somebody into the kingdom, that it lived a wretched life for their entire life. 
My stepdad was in his 60s when he passed away. He lived a wretched life for his entire life. And days before he passes away, God says, you can come on in. And I, I just know I don't love people like that. <laughs> I don't, outside of God, I don't have that type of love in me. And it taught me about the love of God. And it taught me about the mercy of God, the undeserved kindness of God. And um, days after that, 10 days, days after that, my stepdad went home to be with Jesus. And I still remember the day my mom walked into my bedroom. And early that morning, she told me that my stepdad had passed away. And I did something that I never, ever thought I would do the day that I found out he died. I wept. I cried. I never thought that I would cry over my stepdad passing away. And it was proof to me that God had healed my heart, that he had made my heart tender and sensitive towards this man, um, that I had the love of Jesus in me towards him. And I literally wept thinking, man, I, I wonder what it would have been like to experience that restoration in our everyday life. And um, but I'll get to see him one day with Jesus. And, um, but that was my, probably one of my most significant encounters with the love of God. And I got to learn through that process that, you know, forgiveness wasn't for, wasn't for him. Forgiveness was for me. I can't imagine that day if he would have passed away and I would have lived the rest of my life never getting to experience forgiveness face to face with that man. Uh, but in God's mercy, he allowed me to forgive so that I could live the rest of my life free from that bitterness, free from uh, the unforgiveness of actually getting to do it to his face. And um, to this day, when I tell the testimony of what I experienced with my stepdad, it feels like I'm telling somebody else's story because of what God has done and the redemption, the redemptive nature of who Jesus is. When we forgive, when we walk with him, when we trust him in scenarios like this and our brokenness and our family, that was my first major encounter with the love of God. Hmm. Jasmine, could you give us a, a, a glimpse into what your life has looked like since that moment with your stepfather up to now? I'm sure there's a lot that Jesus has done in your life, a lot of trials and different things, as we know, when we walk with God, it's not just an easy walk, but what does that look like for you? What has God done in these last couple of years? Yeah. Um, if I go back even a little bit farther than that, um, something I love to also testify and just share about is before my mom married my stepfather, my mom and dad were married and they were together. And like I said, they got divorced when I was two. And so there were years in my life where I just didn't know my dad, my biological father. We weren't in relationship. Um, got to see him a few times here and there, but our relationship was marked by a lot of disappointment, a lot of just not showing up, not keeping his word, not being present, um, a lot of brokenness there. And um, right after God restored my relationship with my stepdad, the Lord restored my relationship with my father. My stepdad's funeral was the first day, my first day of school, my junior year of high school. And I would say from my junior year, senior year of high school into college, my, my dad, my biological father and I began to build our relationship again and began to get close again. And I remember he also, he even came to one of my college basketball games and there were tons of years of missed games and missed moments, but God began to slowly but surely rebuild that relationship. And then I think the other beautiful thing is that God, God brought in amazing other men of God to kind of help father me in moments where I needed fathers in my life. And it's amazing how when there are gaps in our life, God will fill them. Uh, he'll fill them, yes, first and foremost with himself, with his love, but he also has a way of bringing relationships into our life to fill gaps that uh, maybe our parents and their humanity couldn't fill, didn't have the ability to fill, and he did that with me. And so, yes, my stepdad or my, my biological father came back into my life, but he also brought incredible men of God who fathered me all throughout college and uh, into just the rest of my life. And so, you know, that, that journey after my stepdad passed away, I really grew a lot in my relationship with the Lord, it really grew my relationship with Jesus. Cause like I said, I had never experienced love like that before. And so I graduated high school, 
moved to college, got a full ride scholarship to play basketball in college and got to experience doing college with the Lord. During that process, leaving high school into college, uh, God set me free of depression and set me free of suicidal thoughts. And I got to live life really knowing what it meant to live life with the Holy Spirit, like with God every day. And so I had a blast in college because I was doing it with God and with so much freedom in my life, not just freedom from living at home, you know, like, but freedom in my, in my soul. My, my, my soul was free from the bondage that I was living in, in middle school and in high school. Obviously my, my stepdad and my dad were not present in some major moments in my life. And so as much as God was filling those voids and as much as he brought men of God to come in and father me, um, there were gaps in my life that, like I said, they needed to be filled and that I was looking to fill on my own in different moments. And so I had to like heal in a lot of ways from being fatherless for most of my life. I had mama wounds that I needed to heal from, broken trust that had happened between my mom and I that the Lord began to heal throughout college. And it's really beautiful how the Lord even began to restore my relationship with my mom. We got a chance to talk through some of these moments, some of these things that happened that for most of which she had a totally different perspective of what was happening than what I had because she was walking through it in first person, you know, in, the, in a different way that I was. And so it's really amazing to, to grow up and get to have those conversations with her and process it and to cry together and weep about moments together, but just to experience healing through so many of those moments together with my mom. So much breakthrough. Like I said, there's freedom from suicide, freedom from depression. I even had a pornography addiction when I was in middle school and high school that the Lord set me free from. I, I found myself at a point in college in a homosexual relationship that the Lord brought me through and set me free of, delivered me from. Uh, but there, there's been a journey with God to the point to where today I can look back on those years and say, God has been faithful. He's been a deliverer. He's saved me. He's pulled me out of miry clay. He's he's saved me from moments where I didn't I couldn't save myself. I didn't know how to get out of scenarios of my own, whether it be in my family or in uh, addictions, pornography addiction, or whether it was in a relationship, a homosexual relationship that I shouldn't have been in in college. God has delivered me. He's set me free. Mm -hmm. So today it's really beautiful. I'm, I'm married. I'm about to have a baby, building a family with my my husband and uh, we're we're in ministry together. We get to see people set free from the homosexual lifestyle. We get to see people healed from their own family trauma together and walk people through moments in ministry together. Um, and so uh, it's amazing what God will do with a life that's surrendered to Him, even after everything that I've walked through, everything that I've been through. Yeah, Jasmine, thank you for just your transparency and. You know, I know God will provide another time for us to go in depth in some other things, you know, uh, onto some of those things that God has continued to free you from. I want to go back to what you did speak about specifically, though, and was the trauma as a child. And um, could you give us a, a, a glimpse as to what that healing process looked like when it came to uh, seeing domestic violence, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure that there's could be even some PTSD from that of, you know, seeing all of these things, hearing the sounds, the visuals, yeah. how, how were you able to now looking back and as you help others, even how have you been able to process that with God and kind of just heal from that? Yeah. So there's been a couple different ways that the Lord has walked me through healing from some of the trauma and the domestic violence and the abuse that I experienced or saw. I would say one of the ways he's done that is through inner healing. And so there's been some really intentional moments uh, where I've sat with the Lord and asked him questions. Uh, Lord, where were you when this happened? Uh, where were you in that moment where my mom was in a chokehold in the kitchen after my stepdad threw the, the food across the room. Where were you in that moment? And these really beautiful encounters with God where he will show me where he was. And in some of these moments, I can you know remember these encounters with God where he'll show me he was sitting right next to me, weeping with me, holding me, protecting me. Um, moments where I know I was kept by God, where I was not in those moments and he'll show me, oh, it was me 
that was defending you. It was me that was holding you. It was me that kept you in that moment. And just getting to ask God those questions and giving him an opportunity to answer and to speak life to me and to say to me, uh, daughter, it was never my intention for you to be in a scenario like that. Daughter, that was not my best for you. Like just hearing his voice speak to the wounds, speak to those broken places has been a major road into healing in my life. Um, there's something about being in the presence of God, spending time with God and asking him hard questions, opening up the word and allowing him to speak his truth. And that's what, that was, that's been a major part of my healing with him. I would say another road way or pathway to healing for me has, has been my husband. There are things that I didn't know I needed healing from until I got married. I thought there's so many things where I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm, I'm doing awesome. Well, this doesn't bother me at all. And I got married and my husband's not abusive by any means. He is so amazing. He's, he is the love of God in a body for me. And it, it was, it's God. It's beautiful what the Lord has done and bringing us together. But it's, it's crazy, you know, in our humanity, there are still moments that come up where we both have family history and we both have things that we've had to walk through in our childhood that might come up in a moment of tension or a moment where we're having to walk through something hard together and and he may not do something horrible but just a slight raise of the voice might sound to me like a large like a loud scream and an abusive word but that may not be exactly what he said or how he intended to say it um and so God has used marriage to heal those places in me, which is one of, I believe, which is one of God's beautiful plans for marriage is that he heals us in marriage, in the way God ordained marriage to be with one man and one wife, one husband, one wife together in covenant, uh, in the presence of God, uh, in covenant with the Lord. There's been so many healing moments for me. And so I wish I could say that all of none, nothing ever happens. I've never had another traumatic moment or some, you know, get to me from what happened in my childhood. And the truth is things still come up, but God uses my husband. He uses marriage. He uses relationships to heal, to be a healing balm to those places. And I'm so thankful for that because every day I get to heal more and more. And so there's things that God does sovereignly in his presence that only he can do in us to heal us. And then there are other things that he knows where he's hidden healing in our spouse, where he's mm -hmm. hidden healing for us in our marriage or in other relationships in our life. And so that's been one of some of the ways that God has healed me through this process. Are you still journaling? Yes, I still, I definitely still journal very consistently. I love journaling. Mm -hmm. Jasmine, who is Jesus to you? Oh, um, I think I would just say today, <laughs> Jesus is mercy to me. Um, undeserved kindness. I think about the forgiveness that Jesus led me into, you know, with my stepdad, even with my biological father. And, um, you know, it's kind of silly when I think about it, how hard it was now because I'm, I've become more aware as I've grown in my relationship with Jesus of how much I've been forgiven. Um, and it's crazy how the more you're aware of how much you've been forgiven, how much easier it becomes to forgive other people who have hurt you. And so of the many things Jesus has been and is to me, I would in this moment specifically say what's rocking me right now in my mind, in my heart, uh, in this moment is Jesus as mercy, his undeserved, his completely undeserved, undeserved kindness towards me. Jasmine, for those who are watching right now on the other side of the screen and are finding themselves in the same position that you once were as a child, uh, maybe they're currently seeing domestic violence in their home, or maybe they're grown up and uh, they remember seeing that. And they're even right now, maybe thinking of all of those times that they've seen domestic violence in their home. What's uh, could you just give a word of encouragement, a word of wisdom to those who are watching right now? I'm thankful for the day that the Lord 
led me into asking him to make himself known to me in the midst of all of it. And um, I would encourage people who may be walking through, experiencing some of the same things that I experienced, to ask God to come, to be with you, right in your room, right in the middle of the moments. Um, for the scenario that I was in, it wasn't something that I could change. It wasn't something that I could do anything about as a little girl. And so I felt very helpless. But me asking God that day, hey, I need to know if you're real. Can you just come and be here in my room with me? And then the fact that he came and I figured out that I can ask him to come anytime and he'll come. That was a game changer for me because after that day, it wasn't like scenarios stopped happening in my house. Um, but I learned that I had access to him, that I had access to God through Jesus, that through Jesus, that God would come anytime and make himself known right in my room, right in my car, right in whatever space that I was in. And so my word of wisdom to maybe somebody who's in a similar scenario where maybe you feel hopeless or helpless, like you can't change the scenario, it's happening around you. Um, give him a chance, ask him to come and make himself known wherever you are. Invite Jesus to come and be with you in your room. And I believe he's gonna come and he'll be with you and he will be your comforter. He will be your protector. He will be your defender. He will be your father. All the things that he was for me, he will be for you as well. Jasmine, could you pray for those who are, are ready to receive God into their life, ready to receive Jesus? Um, and even for those who maybe have just walked away, you know, and, and are listening to your testimony and are ready to reestablish, to have a relationship with Jesus. Could you just pray for those who are watching right now? Yeah. Well, Lord, we just thank you for every person watching right now that is ready for you every person who's hungry for you, to know you, to know your presence, to encounter you in the way that you encountered me. Um, I pray that you would make yourself known to them right now in this moment. I pray for tangible, manifest encounters with the God, the living God right now. Um, Father, I even prayed that you would surround them with people uh, that can teach them about Jesus, people that can disciple them in your ways, people that can disciple them in, uh, in, your, in your, your heart, in your mind, the way you think, Lord, the way you love, Lord. Um, and I, I pray that in this moment that you speak to them, the way that you've spoken to me, the way that you've been real to me, would you speak to them right now? Um, and I pray that you make your word come alive to them. Uh, make your word come off of the pages and uh, and just be real to them. Teach them, Holy Spirit, about Jesus. And Lord, we love you. And we just thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, what you're doing in their lives right now. We honor you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the US right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.